From the makers of Spiders Will Eat Your Face comes The Animal Saga, three films including Spiders Will Eat Your Face, Hamsters, The History, and Goldfish Bowl, Death by Glass. All this pet history on Amazon and Big Weasel, Lil Weasel dot club. Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Joe. And you're listening to How Many Fingers Am I Holding Up, the podcast. And this week, we're reviewing Minions for, I mean, Despicable Me 3. Welcome to How Many Fingers Am I Holding Up, featuring two guys getting uninstalled and reviewing movies in a weekly podcast form. And a special thank you goes out to Dan Martin, who left that for us on Facebook. Thanks, Dan. That's certainly what we're doing on a weekly basis. Yes. (laughs) Uninstalling our minds via alcohol. Yes. For your listening pleasure. And the poison of choice this week is Bushlight. It is. It's right here. It's um, it's liquid. <laughs> it's a light, light, light beer. We've had this as our side beer for an episode, but uh, let me take another sip. It's been, our, it's been our side bitch for a while, and now we're <laughs> we got rid of that other bitch, and now this is the. It's a pretty pretty generic light beer. Uh, it's definitely at the lower end of light beers. <laughs> it's not. I think this is what most people think light beer tastes like. Yeah, it's not great. It's mostly water yeah it's just water beer which i don't mind because uh i have a high rate of volume intake i feel like joe just can't stop chugging liquids <laughs> i can't That's usually you'll see me with a seltzer or something on here too because i'm trying to trick myself and i think i'm what is the actual I'm drinking more beer i percentage on this does it was... say Looking earlier, I wonder if I can look it up on Untapped. Four point one percent alcohol by oh, is volume. Four point one's yeah. not bad. That's pretty high. I remember, like, yeah, that's I think like PBR of... is like three point seven or something like that. Yeah, there's and a we lot thought of... PBR was high when we were in college. <laughs> I think um, on last week or next week's episode, Baby Driver. Uh, that magic hat was only four point something. Mm. So this is wow. I Deceptive. Didn't, yeah, I didn't realize this was so high. It's no bush league. That's it's for no, sure. It's bush light. It's just a little preview of what's coming up. <laughs> this feels like a fourth episode, but it's actually only a second episode. Of the night. It, it is, but no. Fortunately, we don't have anything after this for tonight. We got a quick two uh, two episode plot going on here quick one two yes one two punch that would have been a better phrase to use there right yeah well that was more of a visual gag for our youtube users for oh, yeah. soundcloud users Just a little easter egg for those guys Your watching head. on youtube <laughs> thanks guys all 45 of you a lot of you are migrating to youtube and this is scaring me we need some more soundcloud users go back you gotta listen to both you can't just go to youtube you've got to play it on soundcloud as well you're scaring us thank you everyone to who's been listening on um who's just been following us on you know facebook twitter and seeing our trailers now mm-hmm. we've kind of changed up the game our marketing scheme you guys like this? Uh, How are we doing? Could you guys <laughs> give email us, some us notes? <laughs> could you give us some unsolicited podcast advice? <laughs> Preferably in the form of a SoundCloud comment telling us that we say the word like, <laughs> like too much. Too much. <laughs> I still want to have an episode where we drink every time we say like. We would not survive. <laughs> no, I think... Or... Well, no, I think we could survive if we did a light beer. If we were trying to... If oh, we did just a, a sip a light, every t- okay. light beer, yeah. If if we just did a sip, and I think it could also uh, be a fun drinking game for that our could listeners. Could be this episode. I don't want to do it this episode. <laughs> no, I'm not ready for that. 
I just said lepisode, Mike. I don't want to do it this some time. some episode of the future, we will do the John Smith drinking it's a game. where predetermined we predetermined. We drink every time we oh, say Oh, it's like, not even John Smith. Literally, we're complaining about this guy, John Smith, who uh, sent us a, a SoundCloud comment who said, like, you guys say like fucking enough? And he said an, a bunch of other things. And we appreciate you, John Smith, for listening. But then literally some other guy, literally a week <laughs> later, was like, you guys say like enough? Like, we've also received emails about how much we say like. <laughs> Let's just get it out there. We're aware. Yeah. But are you guys aware that this is a drinking podcast that is unscripted and we're just having a discussion as we would as two friends comfortably talking? It's definitely Without my, fear of judgment. Mm-hmm. It's definitely my favorite word to use as a crutch. Oh, it's or, a filler word. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. It's when you're when you're. I've noticed we only say it when we're like coming up with thoughts like on the fly. Like if mm-hmm. it's not like an idea that you've thought out and you're kind of formulating the idea in your head and you're like saying these things to right. like fill the space as you're coming up with the words mm-hmm. that you are like thinking of. But yeah, as a drunk podcast, I feel like you should. Um, expect yeah expect that <laughs> some of those words yeah it's gonna happen yeah uh so yeah but thanks for listening john john we appreciate you and keep your... listening keep leaving those comments it's just increasing our seo exactly honestly guys uh if you agree or disagree with anything that we're saying on these episodes go ahead and leave us a comment on youtube Go ahead and leave us a comment on SoundCloud like John has, because it honestly, it improves our popularity mm-hmm. of, uh, yeah, it brings more people to our um He commented episode. on multiple, multiple episodes, so he must have, it couldn't have been so bad that he turned off the first episode. Right. You chose to listen to that second episode, John, so. <laughs> if anybody wants to see a fucking wild manifesto of just <laughs> thoughts that don't make sense go to the while we're talking about soundcloud comments yeah check out our baby our uh, boss, boss baby, baby episode go go on sound go on our soundcloud soundcloud.com slash um, we'll respond to almost any comment we didn't respond to anything that was left in this very long thread on soundcloud on our uh, boss baby episode where it was essentially yeah a manifesto about donald trump <laughs> And like paranoia, like it sounded like something written by like a schizophrenic. <laughs> like, yeah, no, it just give us a little taste if you could find it, Joe. Oh, yeah, I gotta. So it's soundcloud.com slash how many fingers podcast and um, how many fingers podcast. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, Jesus, let me scroll down <laughs> to go find it. It's honestly, it's a fucking trip. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just read the first one. By the oh way, my God, by the way, we're reviewing Despicable Me three this it's week. <laughs> way too long. No, you don't read. Don't yeah, just the first need, like two sentences. Okay, you need to understand. For a guy with Aspergers, it takes a lifetime to build a relationship with a friend. They eliminated everyone I've ever cared about they. out of my life in one year, so I could surround me. So they could surround me, dominate me, and control me. I have no freedom. I'm not allowed to have a job. I'm not allowed to receive or send emails to family. There's a bunch of like good like one line comments that he left like later on in that thread. Um, to 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 give you a preview of the second comment, they say they're going to murder me again. <laughs> He's already been murdered. He's going to be murdered again when they get to me. So this is the competition you have if you're trying to leave a, a comment on SoundCloud. Please leave us a comment on SoundCloud. Anything really other than this. schizophrenic manifestos will probably <laughs> respond to on SoundCloud, as evidenced yeah, by really John didn't. Smith's yeah. comments. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we are reviewing Despicable Me 3 this week. Uh, let me read that IMDb description, Joe, and then we can... Get into you can it. set the stage for this wonderful movie. I will. Uh, Gru... Meets his long-lost, charming, <laughs> cheerful, and more successful twin brother, Drew, who wants to team up with him for one last criminal heist. That's all you need to know about this. Movie. Is that it? Is that the end? <laughs> That's the IDP description. Oh, no. Completely. All right. So I do want to talk about this because I feel like Go for it. I've been seeing 
commercial or uh, trailers more accurately for this movie for like two years. It feels like now since we started this podcast, I remember seeing trailers for Despicable Me three. Really? So that, like that's that like two thousand like. 15 probably in the later half of 2015 okay. the theater year 2015 probably calendar when, year 2016 when, when did minions at that come point out? I, phew, beats me <laughs> i haven't to be to be clear i haven't seen despicable me one or despicable me or despicable minions me two. came out 2015 okay so, so this was yeah. probably the trailers were probably coming out and i bet those were probably done by different i mean same studio but different groups right. of people mm-hmm. you know the minions is like a side thing so it's probably like calendar year 2016, but film year 2015, we were seeing trailers for uh, Despicable Me 3. But they, the first trailers were really emphasizing like the Balthasar Brat character, the Trey Parker character, and was really showing, casing like his character, that first scene on like the boat with like the bubble gum and everything. Right. No mention of the like double Steve Carell role. No mention mm-hmm. of Drew as the twin brother. Right. And then like six months later, they just completely phased out any mention of Balthazar Brat from the trailers. And it was all just this trailer with Drew in it. And there was nothing about them going to fight like Balthazar Brat. To the point where I thought, since I hadn't seen the first two Despicable Me's, okay. that I was just remembering that trailer from Despicable Me 2 like three years ago. And that that character wasn't even in this movie. Like I thought Trey Parker was in Despicable Me 2 and then Despicable Me 3, the entire plot was just him and Steve Carell. Right. Steve Carell. I mean, Steve even Carell. before I get into my notes, can I say that all of the trailers involving this film are fucking really... They're not top-tier animated trailers, but they're all pretty good. I mean, everything involving Trey Parker's character is like really funny trailer wise. Mm-hmm. Like they, they have these this kind of like eighties <laughs> character. We don't even really get into the whole like he was a child actor who's still reeling from being canceled on uh, his popular television show where he plays like an antagonist in the eighties, um, or like kind of just yeah exactly. Um, but he just he's just like this 80s driven um antagonist where he's you know he's dancing to michael jackson yeah, he's, he's just like, he's living in the past and I'm yeah bad. yeah and it's it's really funny and then we also have this other trailer that shows the and again i haven't seen either any of the so none of us have seen anything in the despicable me universe well after these trailers i watched oh. some of it oh, okay but but um, another one of the trailers that I saw before I uh, dove into this um, franchise was uh, the Minions, who we're all familiar with, but the Minions in Prison, which I think is like a really... Oh, I didn't know there was a trailer with the Minions okay. in Prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a um, Minions in Prison sort of trailer. I forget exactly what song they have. It's... um. It's very iconic like rap song and it's really funny Mm -hmm. and the way that they cut it is very funny and I kind of thought it was going to be like um, you know in like uh, Austin Powers Goldmember where um, he gets sent to jail and then Mini Me is there too in jail and they they, (laughs) they do like the rendition of Jay-Z's like it's hard knock like or whatever that's so funny and Mm -hmm. I thought that was going to to kind of be parodied in Despicable Me 3, but boy, am I wrong, because the fucking... It's a Pharrell song when they're in the prison. The plot of this movie like every is, scene is in this movie. so fucking all over the place. But let me get into... Yeah, give me these notes. A little bit of the notes, because I haven't really taken many notes, because that's how seriously I take this movie. Um, Despicable Me 3 is directed by Pierre Coffin. You're just and- reading this off of... Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no. Off of oh, I've Wikipedia got you figured out. <laughs> an IMDb page. Um, it's directed by Peter Coffin. And because for some reason, Mike gets all the cool movies that you know it's about. And I get <laughs> It's literally just an, an alternating one. <laughs> yeah, we alternate like cool and dumb fucking movies. And I get all the dumb movies. Okay, so Despicable Me 3 was directed by Peter Coffin and Kyle Balda. And then co directed by Eric Gilliam. Is there not already co-directors there? Exactly. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's stylized 
that way on both Wikipedia okay. and IMDb. Well, Kyle Balda has been working professionally in feature animation for the past 15 years. Who are you talking about? Oh, Kyle, Kyle. Balda? I'm just looking okay. up these right. characters. So yeah. he's done the Lorax, a bunch of other stuff, Minions, Minions Mini Movie, Weenie, Despicable Me 3, Minions 2 coming out. Just to go over a bunch of his credits. Pierre Coffin, what do we got for him? Probably animation as well. But Mike, oh, he's when, an actor and director. But when when Despicable you, Me Two, Minions, and Despicable Oh, he's done all of the. Wait, no, he might have just been an actor for those. But when you're at the IMDb page for Despicable Me Three, it has. Um, Kyle Balda, Pierre Coffin. Yeah, it has Kyle Baldwin, Pierre Coffin, and it says one more credit, and you click on that, and it says. Eric Gillon. And then it says co-director. And then even on Wikipedia, it says that too. Um, Wikipedia also claims that this is the third installment of the Despicable Me franchise. But again, I think minions. that's wrong yeah. because they're forgetting the Minions movie. Um, like we all wanted to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we all want to forget that. <laughs> I mean, there's also, I've seen a few of these. Uh, there's been uh, numerous Minions short films because I'm sure they're fucking super easy to create. Home Makeover, Orientation Day, Banana, Puppy, Panic in the Mailroom, Training Wheels, Binky Nelson, Unpacified, Competition, Crow Minions, and Mower Mil Minions, which we saw before uh, The Secret Life of Pets, which we didn't review, and I'm now realizing that, that I just saw Secret Life, of Pets, Secret Life of Pets by myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but that's just the expansion and how easy it is to throw Minions into a fucking short film and make a short film about it. Um, I think should stuff it like Minions DLC. <laughs> yeah, no. I think literally like there is like a if you go to uh you saw this, right? There's like a Max Landis sort of uh verbal essay that he does. I did. It's um, now coming back to me as you're saying it, so keep going. Mm -hmm. Um where Max Landis talks openly about his complicated dating relationship and how he has received kind of this these tickets to go to the Universal Studios or whoever puts on fucking Despicable Me or Minions or whatever and he is tripping the fuck out on Molly and while he's on Molly and while he's with this girl and again it's I highly encourage you to go see this because it is one of the more intelligent things that Max Landis does, even though I have a, a boner for Max Landis. I know, Mike, you might feel opposite. Um, I just haven't really seen a lot of oh, his yeah, movies no, he, that he's he, done. He's a, he's a cool dude. Um, he's, this he, video in particular is very interesting. Yeah. He's, he's a champion for screenwriters, I think, because he tells it as it is as a screenwriter. And again, he is the son of John, um, Landis. John Landis, who has directed such films as like Blues Brothers and a great, Clue, yeah, Animal or House. Clue or... um, but he talks about how he's really fucking tripping out on uh, Molly, which is uh, a f uh, like a pure, I guess version of dmt or ecstasy and he's and he basically starts to picture himself as a minion in one of these sort of universal stores and he starts to go on about how many uh, how despicable me started once as this like really sweet script about how like a villain turns good but then how it was injected through the sort of corporate scope of kind of like we need these minions these like disposable kind of marketing like little guys yeah. and we see that a lot i mean moana kind of had like their own version of minions we kind of had a i forget some other studio had some other version of minions it's just a very like frozen had like the the troll rock monsters mm -hmm. and stuff and yeah and that's that's the whole reason this franchise has been kept alive despicable me and that's why we've made a trilogy that's why minions have their own movie that's why in 2020 we're gonna have minions 2 um it's because minions are so marketable and they're jibber jabber and in everything 
Uh, yeah, but go ahead and look that up on YouTube if you haven't already. It's just Max Landis. I don't really know what Max it... Landis min minions will minions, probably get you there. Yeah, Max Landis on drugs. <laughs> he also informs you that it's only okay to take this molly or whatever drug that you're doing x amount of times a year or your brain's gonna go to shit <laughs> thanks Max. speaking of like two worlds colliding i saw like a tweet from like uh max landis like s saying something where like he or maybe it was the other way around but like jenny nicholson was like i guess he went up to jenny nicholson at like a conference or something oh no and like tapped her on the shoulder and like she retweeted his re his tweet and was just like why did you touch me? <laughs> it was like super cringy. It might have been, I, I didn't know what the act, interaction was actually like. It might have been something where it was like a cute, like meeting of the worlds. Right. And she's just playing on that by That's being funny. like standoffish. Uh -huh. But the impression I got was that it was actually standoffish of like, I didn't give you permission to touch me. <laughs> That's just because really you see funny. me on YouTube and you think you're like a person that has that agency to touch people. Yeah. I am looking forward to what he does with that Netflix series that comes out in December with Will Smith and Joel Edgerton. Oh, that's where right. It's He's kind of, of that, like yeah. an alien. Is that a series or a movie? That's a series and like, well, actually, I don't fucking I feel like know. it's an original movie for Netflix. Yeah, it might be. But I, Max Landis has done a lot of videos on it where he says like, that's his dream coming alive, kind of. Like, that's his, this will be his thing, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm excited to see what that looks like. Um yeah but minions or despicable me three <laughs> minions four <laughs> basically <sighs> stars steve carell um well i mean i guess i guess they're essentially reprising the role uh steve carell miranda crosgrove uh dana guerrero um Geyer. what is guyer maybe guyer okay I don't know, Geyer. Uh, Julie Andrews, Kristen Wiig, Steve Coogan, uh, Trey Parker, and Jenny Slate. And, um, yeah, basically. I don't know who Jenny Slate is in this movie. Valerie she's, Da Vinci. She's the, um, she's very, again, that, that's, oh, that, the, that's a complaint. The she's one who the, takes over for the, right, the, the kind the, of like the good guy agents, the good guy spy agents. The racist basically. role. <laughs> yes, the very kind of Jew, Jewish stereo, stereotype. Yeah. There's a bunch of stuff, we'll get into that later, but there's a bunch of stuff in this where like I, I know what they're doing because they're trying to play two kids, but they'll just kind of go overboard with some like racial stereotypes. And mm -hmm. it's like, even though you're doing that for kids, I feel uncomfortable when you have a, a person talking in a Jewish accent and you make their nose like super big. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. And especially like when you show kind of their backside and they're supposed to be like super attractive and then they turn around and it's like, psych, they're Jewish. <laughs> and they have like fucked up teeth and a unibrow and yeah. they have like a Jewish accent. It's it's really disturbing mm -hmm. kind of. There's on a lot of stuff level. in this where yeah. like I know, I know the reason... I know why they could get to that and why they could try to excuse it. It's because the entire animation style of Despicable Me is like exaggerated mm -hmm. features. Like when they exactly. show like a fat yeah. guy, he's like mm -hmm. so fat that like every part of him is jiggling as he's walking and he's mm -hmm. fucking like walking jello blob. But it's weird when you get into like race and culture with exaggerated features. Like oh, that's why we have like, you know, cartoons that we don't display anymore because they were exaggerating features that should not be exaggerated right. as stereotypes and i and i love jenny slate and everything she does and i can almost even understand that she wouldn't understand this until she like actually saw she probably it. didn't see the character as she's reading the voice mm -hmm. you know they probably built it around this like kind of voice that she was doing right yeah um but yeah as uh, shown in previous films grew is now sort of an agent of the anti-villain league or I think they refer to it as the AVL. AVL yeah. um, and uh, basically him and his uh, new wife from the last film, uh, who's played by Kristen Wiig. Yeah, so I, have you, did you actually end up watching Despicable Me and Despicable Me 2? I haven't watched Despicable Me 2. I've watched a portion of Despicable Me. Because I haven't seen either, but I do have an understanding, or at least this is from what I can gather from context is that Despicable Me, 
I haven't finished it. I haven't finished. <laughs> that was not planned. He's actually watching I it right now. <laughs> this is Sabri had it on DVD, <laughs> and um, I couldn't get through the first third of it. And I know a lot of people that I really love and respect. My sister, uh, a few friends that I really, really like. Uh, whose movie opinions that I really respect, and they love Despicable Me and the whole franchise attached to it, but I can't get into it, mm -hmm. kind of. And I mean, I'll expand on, obviously, the third film of this franchise, the cracks really start to show. Oh, yeah. You know, um, it's kind of like, literally, I said, before I watched this film, I said, that fucking middle blonde child... She's completely disposable. And I don't know what happens in the Is she last... in the first one? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. They all get they all get a dot so here's here's the Just because of her hair color, I thought maybe she came in in the second one, because I only remember well, the two black haired ones. Here's the premise is Gru is attempting to he's a villain. He's sort of a villain, and that's a really interesting premise, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he just does shit to like piss off people kind of thing he gets off and then later he and there's a callback to that at the beginning of this movie when a muscular white guy is listening to migos in like <laughs> in like a convertible like... yeah 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 and um handsome and wealthy uh <laughs> migos check him out um basically and um he like smashes him into the side of a building because they're like comparing like hydraulic you know, cars. Yeah, hydraulics. There. Why is he white? But also he smashes him into the side of a building. That's kind of a callback to like shit that Gru would did in the first movie. And um he essentially adopts these three girls from this kind of like evil adoption agency as a ploy to get them into a certain place to, you know, take another supervillain's uh technology or whatever mm -hmm. uh, but what happens is he finds out that his life was perhaps maybe so empty that he needed to be a supervillain and that um you know these girls have kind of really showed him the way of just being a happy and decent guy yeah that's it's a that's a plot that kind of writes itself right yeah in a so, good way so i don't think either any of these girls are um related um, they're kind of just a, you know, they're kind of just all clinging to each other within this adoption agency. They're they're kind of like going out and whatever. But anyway, this this middle child, the blonde one, I've always since the first film, I've been like, there's no real place for her, kind of in this line of because she's kind of mischievous herself, right? She is. And again, that's all we know about her in this movie, in mm -hmm. Despicable Me 3. Um, the other character, the older one, kind of has a line with, like, the new mom of Kristen Wiig. And then the younger one kind of has this continued kind of, like, wasn't that so funny that she wanted that unicorn, unicorn, unicorn from... Unicorn so fluffy. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. And that's, like, her entire plot line of this movie. There's no reason to explain it, that it, it kind of felt like we were getting we were approaching plot lines that i thought we would have covered in despicable me too when he's marrying Kristen wig in terms of right. her relationship to all these kids and like trying to be like a mom like that seems like a plot from despicable me too of like i mean i guess i haven't seen it so maybe it ends with them I, yeah, marrying I, I, each I, other I, and they didn't have time mm -hmm. to get to that plot line but that just seems like a sequel type of plot yes. of like mm -hmm. Things have changed around here, and blah, uh, yeah, blah. Uh, yeah. I think it's a it's a symptom of the second one, and it's trying to carry on this kind of like, well, I guess she's a new character because like now she's the love interest he's been trying to get, and now it's kind of like you know. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I think um, what is. I shouldn't have asked this question without knowing the answer. Um, but Illumination Entertainment, I suppose that is a division of Universal Pictures, which Universal Pictures did Shrek, 
I assume. No, DreamWorks think... did Shrek. Okay. I remember reading some sort of statistic that Despicable Me only fell short of selling something short of, like, Shrek. So, like, they have something here. They're probably just comparing it to other movies that are not Disney Pixar. Right. Because that was the impressive part about Shrek is that it was like, oh, you don't have to be a Disney Pixar animated film right, to right, sell, right. like, mm-hmm. mad tickets and mm-hmm. be a box office success. People love the Minions, though. Can we agree on that? People love the fucking Minions. A certain type of people like the Minions. Well, a certain, a certain ty- age group likes the Minions. A and cer- everybody above them. A certain type of Minions. I mean, a cer- but they're able to put millions of dollars down on the line to kind of make a cash grab here. Like Despicable Me 3. And it, it fucking shows. Mm-hmm. I mean, they made a shit ton of money. Even in the first week. And I think maybe because they don't have the expectations of like Pixar, whereas like Cars had like a, I think had a higher rating on Rotten Tomatoes than this did. But that was a story of like Cars 3 is like a 65 on Rotten Tomatoes is like the lowest that like a Pixar has done. This is like a 61 and no one cares about the rating. They're just like, look how much money like Despicable Me 3 made. Like, right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean. Uh, Gru is now an agent of the Anti-Villain League, the AVL, and he and his new wife, Lucy, are sent to foil the plans of Balthazar Brat, a supervillain who was a formal child actor who portrayed a young supervillain in a popular television series before the show was canceled as a result of puberty. Obviously, he's aging he was a really like cute star yeah. of this like and like anti-hero show in the 80s um i love his like line of i've been a bad, bad boy, boy. <laughs> which is really i love i really he, like almost everything about his character yeah. He's almost too good for the movie that he's in. Like he's what the- very clever as a villain mm-hmm. because like the his his hubris as a character is kind of built into his actual flavor. Whereas like his whole flavor is based on because he was canceled in the eighties, he hasn't really moved on from the past there. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of living in the eighties, but that also builds his entire flair of like, he's still wearing the shoulder pads. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of jokes that are built around like his sense of style and his music and all that. And he's still just listening to like, you know, Michael Jackson's bad. And like, Mm -hmm. he plays like a jump from Van Halen at one point, like on like the guitar and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like he's got a really nice like flavor to him. And Dre Parker is like a fantastic voice actor who brings like a lot of like character and like vivality to. And Dre Parker isn't even asked a lot in this film. He's it's. Barely, it's not like... It's a lot of animation, but he does well with what he's getting Right, there's a lot of visual gags, and it's not exactly what you'd expect from Trey Parker, uh, who is uh, one of the two founders of, or one of the two creators of South Park with uh, Matt Stone. Um, You know, and he does very sort of eccentric voices during South Park. There's a very distinct style or flavor to those voices and this sounds more like uh trey parker than anybody in south park Mm -hmm. kind of uh so it's very interesting but he does a really great job of it he's really well written too like the beginning of this movie i was kind of like on board i was kind of like the character is very well established they do mm -hmm. nothing with it Exactly. But anything that's kind of like put through that filter of kind of like the VCR grain or whatever Mm -hmm. of looking back on old episodes and kind of showing his progression of like being like a cute child actor to like somebody who is going through puberty and has like acne or something and is not is not transitioning well into well, it's like just, it's a really know. interesting concept to like mm-hmm. make this super villain that was a former child star right. and is now has become the character that he's playing like mm-hmm. that's just fresh and original to me and like everything that he was involved with that was why like the, the i made such a point about the 
difference between like the first trailer, which is like really focusing on him, right. and the second trailer, which is kind of like, oh, it's just Despicable Me again. But like the first right. one made me actually want to see this movie and watch the rest of the franchise mm-hmm. so that I would understand this movie more because I was like, oh, like if Trey Parker's involved, like maybe it like it's a better be. movie. Right, yeah. Like maybe I misjudged the first two movies in the franchise mm-hmm. and like this must be like enough of a juicy role that he's willing to like foray into doing like kids animated movies not just animation like you would expect him to be in like sausage party or something not like despicable right. me mm-hmm. three so then to go from that to like the the other trailer that has no mention of balthazar brat like that was just a weird transition i and again i really like the beginning of this movie and i mean essentially at the beginning we see this tr- this sort of trailer of balthazar brad and he's He's robbing this uh, sort of ship that's transporting this diamond that he needs and Gru and his wife and the minions that are accompanying him um, supposedly, you know, take this diamond, you know, Mm -hmm. away from him. And then immediately the Jewish stereotype uh, played by Jenny Slate. (laughs) (laughs) So uncomfortable. Um becomes the new boss of the AVL and fires them. And this becomes a point of contention because they have to go home and explain that to the three adopted girls that they've been fired. And that's kind of a thing. The plot points don't totally make sense here. Um, Gru is still in the mist of explaining to the minions that he's not like a bad guy anymore for some reason and they strike and take off i um, think i mean not that i want to defend this movie but i think the the logic there was that now that you don't have a job why don't you go back to being a villain again like you know right i mean but I they're, that's what they're, that whole slideshow was about they're specifically created i guess to be his minions and to be evil so mm. obviously it, it it is weird they don't have a place in this world but again <laughs> it's i wish they didn't have <laughs> yeah well i mean it's obvious that they don't have a place in this world with this fucking plot that's going on they're so pointless in this plot i can't even like I was willing to like I wish- because because I had to see this movie and I was like maybe I have undersold the Dem- the minions you know maybe they really are these like cute characters that are going to have like an integral part of this plot and I was like leaving a like space of like logic open in my head where I was like in like the final plot like the minions are because in this movie they end up having their own plot line where they leave Gru because they're like oh you don't want to be evil like this is dumb like uh, right. you know. What do they keep saying? Like Baño and like Pino? Or, uh, they have like their weird like right. pseudo Spanish language. I don't, don't want to fucking make sense of that. No. Um, but they keep saying <laughs> that it's it's like it what they're involved in now is bad, so they want to leave because they want to go back to evil stuff. And then I forget why. Oh, they, they, now I remember why. They have the whole fucking sequence where they go and do the American Idol like talent show thing, which is so pandering and like. Just, I know kids were enjoying that, but like everyone else was just kind of like, really? I like, really don't understand. We're that. we're sitting through this like weird jump of logic where like the minions have all these outfits ready and they have all these like choreographed stuff ready and it's like everything just seems to be like put the minions in this situation that'll be funny. Put the minions in this costume that'll be funny. Half of the punchlines with the minions are just like. Oh, they're on the beach. Well, one of them's got to have like coconut bras on, and they, they have to like show their butt or something, or like it's right. weird, like sexual humor with the minions a lot that makes me really uncomfortable, or it's like slapstick humor, which like that I can at least like accept because like you know slapstick humor is whatever, but like the sexual humor is weird, and then like the nonsensical outfit changes. Like I don't know why that's as funny or as well received as it is, where it's just like oh, look at uh, minions in a space costume or minions in a pirate costume or minions in this costume like right. feels like we're at fucking like build a bear or something for like minions like yeah. look at all these different costumes you can put the minions in it's a very strange the minions plot line is very distracting compared to the, what is really happening in this movie because what and it really, never actually ties up the, that was the point that i was trying to make before i get yep. distracted is that they they have their yep. own plot line where they go on their own thing they get right. arrested for 
wandering into again i thought this was going to tie together because they went to hollywood and balthazar bratis keeps saying all this shit about like i'm going to attack hollywood for what they did to me so i thought they were going to be like oh they're already there they're ready to save the day when he starts attacking and they're going to work for good and it would be like the minions redemption storyline that'd be acceptable in my eyes for like a plot yeah but no they go there so that they can have a weird like scene where they sing on american idol but they wandered onto a Hollywood stage so they end up going to maximum security prison for trespassing <laughs> as minions. All of them, and they all automatically have minions, like, inmate costumes, and then they end up, like, escaping from the minion prison, and then when they come back later, again, it was an, an opportunity of, like, they escape from prison, they're intersecting with the plot line. You thought right. there was going to be something yes. where, like, mm-hmm. either they're going the to save Gru, save they're the going to save Gru, mm-hmm. or they're going to save the kids mm-hmm. while Gru goes to save you know, everybody else in the world. And there's never anything where the, the minions ever actually do anything good for this plot. Yeah. Or intersect with it or are meaningful for it in any way. Definitely. Literally all they do is try to like deflate the bubbles that are around the city. And to my knowledge, I don't think they even succeed in like popping the bubbles. Right. And I mean, I mean, they do, but that's such a fucking stupid task for them to do. And also, Again, I really like them in this fucking um, jail setting because, I mean, again, they're like these kind of weird, small shaped yellow people who don't speak the language. It was kind of funny to see them running the jail. Like the scene where the guy was like, oh, you know, we've been waiting a long time to shower. Right. Yeah. It was a little funny. But they're, they're the hardest people in jail and Mm. that's such a funny take and i think that's what a lot of the the trailers relied on is kind of this but i wanted to see it more as this kind of austin powers gold member kind of jail scene where it's kind of like they're in jail for a reason and they break out for a reason but there's no reason they go into jail and there's no real reason they make up a reason that they can have this jail scene and then they get out for God knows, there's what no reason. real reason that they break out, and when they, they do have that, break yeah, they out, have that really forced like sentimental scene of like, oh, look at all the stuff that Gru did for us, but then that falls then like they, flat on its face they because they never help Gru. Gru doesn't miss them one bit. Like Gru, right. like when they leave, he's just like, hey, you guys are promoted, like whatever. Like it's more just like an inconvenience that he doesn't have the workers anymore. He has no sentimental like, oh, like oh, <laughs> I miss the minions mm-hmm. at any oh, point. No. So it's this weird like. <laughs> unreciprocated <laughs> like <laughs> went down the wrong pipe <laughs> relationship between drew and the minions that yeah. like almost makes you feel weirdly sympathetic to the minions because they have this fond <clears throat> memory of Gru and he doesn't give a shit about them so what's so what's <coughs> <coughs> my god i fucking swallowed some beer with my fucking lungs but what's happening with Gru this entire time is kind of an equally interesting plot line Again, they have this kind of Alfred-type butler that kind of comes to Gru, and there's a bunch of fucking stupid slapstick um, sort of just putting off what he's trying to tell Gru. Mm -hmm. Um, But basically, um, Gru has a... um, He's been parent-trapped, or he's been sister-sistered, where the parents split this never fucking happens in real life the parents split and each one of them takes a twin a fucking twin this doesn't happen in real life i always wanted to write some sort of essay about this like this doesn't fucking people don't fucking do this this is twins yeah fucking against the law (laughs) like to withhold information i don't know it's it's a it's morally wrong <laughs> right yeah it's a gigantic moral yeah why in sister sister would that happen both those parents seem reasonable but um basically he's been um separated at birth by his twin drew um and obviously we've seen in the trailers that drew is dressed in all white as opposed to all black and he lives on this private island he's where kind he's... of a, a, a cool dichotomy from Gru, whereas Gru is a like very morose and like downtrodden just kind of like grumpy guy who dresses in all black but he right. wants to do good he's been turned to the, like the the good side and then drew is like an all white 
He's outgoing. He's happy. He's got hair. He's just like, you know, always like singing and doing all these extravagant things. But he wants to be like a bad guy. And he's got kind of this evil side to him. On paper, that's a nice dichotomy. I'm going to grab another beer. Do you want one? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I really wish that they didn't parent trap this. Where I wish the twin was not played by Steve Carell with a higher voice. Um, I wish it was played by somebody who was more like lackadaisical kind of like owen wilson or something who is kind of like more air like he has a really airheaded performance where steve carell kind of trying to do this more like downtrodden as opposed to kind of like i'm dumb and stupid and i want to be like on like a part of this mission i i kind of wish it was played by somebody else i don't really like steve carell's performance as grew to begin with same just like it's a hard mm. accent to keep. But there's times when the voice really works. Mm. We can really get like that gravel into his voice. It's like I'm Gru and I'm talking in this voice. But there's times where like he just kind of loses that gravel through natural dialogue. <coughs> and it's less believable and less interesting to hear him talk in this weird like Eastern European accent. It is. It's kind of like we're listening to like prison Mike for an entire animated <laughs> series. It's like it's really the weird. The <laughs> The worst part. I, I, <coughs> like, again, they have this opportunity where Drew is this guy who has everything that Gru doesn't. Uh, he has hair, aka he has the looks, and he's got the wealth, and he's got everything. He's kind of like... I was listening to, I was telling Mike earlier, I was listening to a podcast called Double Toasted. If you guys haven't checked it out, go check it out. I don't I don't ever shout out other movie review podcasts, but it's a bunch of guys, and they were just like, man, like, this new guy trying to fuck Gru's wife. <laughs> <laughs> and he is, he's kind of like this, oh, Gru, your wife is so beautiful, mm-hmm. kind of. And she's like falling for it. And she's like, he's so romantic, kind of. And he's like, no, that's just your husband with like a full head of hair, kind of. Mm-hmm. And then later, Gru, or Drew, um, reveals that um, this sort of pig island that he lives on is just a front for what used to be... Um, uh, Gru's father, who is recently deceased, um, his sort of villain uh, family business, yeah. business, yeah, and the and we see a long line of uh, evil sort of Gru's where the minions have to be like, oh, oh that female has big boobs, and Gru con yeah. bobin, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's kind of like, okay, well, that's fucking weird and sexist. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> and just the fact that it's like so close to speaking in like Spanish the entire time. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. con that's with yeah, it's Drew with boobs or grew with boobs. Um, but th- there's really this really interesting construct of kind of like he's everything you're not, and so quickly it deludes into he's stupid, mm-hmm. and like he's stupid and he's ruining all of your plans. And I, I really, I really didn't. Well, I thought there was a really nice that. opportunity of like, a. I think every single storyline in this movie falls flat, and some of them are established There's nicely. Too many, too. Like Balthasar Bratt's storyline is established nicely, but wasn't that a really nice opportunity to have like uh, Gru kind of like you know maybe have like a one on one with him about like you know being evil is not all it's cracked up to be. There's some benefits to like being nice, like and maybe there's something about just him being more aware of himself as a person and being less narcissistic. Mm-hmm. And th- 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 there seemed like there was a transformation that needed to happen rather than just beating him in a dance battle for the climax of this movie. But then especially with like Drew's whole storyline of like, you establish him as like, yeah, he's got everything. He's got this, all this stuff that like grew is jealous of, but then without any real reason in the script, it, like you're saying it, it, it switches to, once they start doing physical stuff, Gru mm-hmm. is a much better like agent, essentially, or physical person, so he can do all these things where like Drew is just kind of like clumsy and not good at all of that spy or like sneaking stuff. And it's like, wasn't there an opportunity in there to kind of have like 
Drew maybe, you know, be like, I have all this stuff, but like the one thing I'm jealous is of is like your family that you have. Cause that's the one thing that Drew does kind of have is yeah. like this big family of like three kids and you have mm-hmm. like Drew hitting on his wife being very nice and like uh, exciting to us all as kids. With the kids, we'll start trouble later. That seems like an avenue to be like, you know, Mm -hmm. well, uh, like maybe there's a storyline or a different, better version of the script where like they all like Drew better and Drew is kind of like, you know, don't you see? Like you already have them. I don't have that in my life. Like you're the one who's got everything that I don't have. Like it seemed like there was a conversation between these two twins that was like, Mm so inherently obvious to me in the script and it is just completely missing and i don't know if that's because they didn't think kids would get it so they're just like at the window we don't need that shit more minion scenes well i mean there's a lot of stuff that's obviously in here for parents i mean like the entire um trey parker's character what is his name balthazar brat yeah balthazar brat like obviously kids aren't going to understand 80s references yeah. i feel like their needs i mean along with shrek does this there needs to be adult humor kind of mm-hmm. there needs to be a level of sort of adult um I don't know intelligence in this script kind of I don't, yeah it's just it's it it's feels awesome. like it, it reminds me of like a like Nickelodeon or like Disney Channel like cartoon in many ways mm-hmm. or like it just it seems like a or almost like a sitcom in certain ways where it's like they have all these characters and now that we're in the third movie of this franchise it's like all right let's just put them all in these scenarios and see where they play out and it never really like adapts to being a movie where it's like in the third act, the stakes need to be raised. People need to be in danger or feelings or position in life. Something needs to be at risk so there's something to lose in the third act mm-hmm. so that when there's a resolution to it, we're like, oh, okay, that's what was resolved at the end of this plot. And I, I never felt like these characters were ever in danger at all in this plot. I mm-hmm. never felt like the stakes were really raised, even though Balthazar Brat was like attacking the city. Mm-hmm. It was just like they kept the the tone like too light for the kids the entire time. There was no sense of danger whatsoever. I think like something that I really compare it to as like a good example of that is like The Lion King. I know this is going back like many, many years. Okay. But like The Lion King, like think of like the third act and like the climax of The Lion King where like everything's on fucking like fire and like it's there's parts where there's absolutely no jokes and it's just very much like here's the danger of this scene or here's the reality of like this climax going on or here's this emotional you know confrontation between scar and simba but then at the same time that makes punchlines that are inserted in that scene work all the more like you know when you'll have like pumbaa and timon be like that's mr pig or like zazu will like have some line like the humor works better in the climax when we're kind of like nervous for the characters when you raise the stakes and you're like you know everything could all fall apart they could all die at this point so it's funnier when pumbaa and timon say something or it's funnier when zazu says something right and, like that's kind of like a trope that like a or a crutch that i feel like animated movies have that they can always lean on I feel like this one didn't lean on that and didn't use that kind of trope that's at its disposal, but it also didn't do anything new as well. Mm-hmm. It just kind of just stayed in this like meaningless, like horrible plot of like, you know, everything at the expense of plot for the sake of like jokes and minions and like whatever we can do to entertain kids at all times. But it's like you can entertain kids while also keeping adults interested and making kids care about these characters and adults as well and making a movie that's critically acclaimed as well. Like animated movies have right. done that before yeah. while still being interesting to kids and selling tickets to kids and selling merch and everything to kids. Like and you don't have yeah. to sacrifice story and emotion and stuff like that to sell tickets to kids. And that's why like that sick I mean we had that first trailer with uh the introduction of Trey Parker's sort of uh Brad Balthazar character and everything. And that was really funny with all the, the 80s callbacks. Again, that's fucking really tired and obvious kind of within the movie. Mm-hmm. But then the second movie with the whole minions in jail. And then we also kind of had, we were presented with this whole like twin brother thing. And we kind of got a glimpse of the relationship. The the the, the song that was presented in that, I think, if I'm remembering this right, I think it's Dr. Dre's What's the Difference? Or it's like, like, yeah, you it's and like me, what's you the and difference me, yeah. between me and you? Kind yeah, me of. And, you. and like, 
in that song, that's like rapping between um, uh, Eminem and Exhibit, I think. And it's and it's a Dr. Dre produced beat. And it's kind of like, what's the difference between me and you, kind of? And it's supposed to be like this kind of presentation of like hard and soft. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm hard and you're soft, kind of. And like, we really see that kind of in this movie, but it's not as presented as like as much as I want to be. And, or as I wanted it to be, kind of. Like, it's kind of like, in the trailer, we're kind of seeing the minions being like, we're hard and everybody in this jail is soft and then kind of it's also like Gru is hard and like Drew is soft kind of but we don't completely understand that yet mm -hmm. and yeah no it's 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 like a really interesting song um i mean there's even like in that song i think there's like even like a little bit resentment of like Eminem like feeling about like his wife at the moment too which like really plays into like that trailer too because like it also shows like like drew's wife being like it's just like a really intelligent trailer mm -hmm. um i don't know and it just never paid off in this actual film. yeah there's a lot of like stuff where it's like i feel like the first for the first act of this movie i'm not checked out yet i'm actually like I could see what you're doing and I'm like yeah I know in my head like if you just gave me that first act I could write the fucking third act to this mm -hmm. movie because I know where everything is going like mm -hmm. there has to be that switch where Drew ends up being the more successful in terms of like physical action like he's the one who right. saves the day mm -hmm. but it's because he wanted to have a family and like then at the end like they sort of have it where Drew becomes a part of that family mm -hmm. and that's like a thing there. there there would have to be something with like Balthazar Brat of like him seeing the error of his ways like i feel like there's a redemption arc for him that's kind of like left on the table and then there's probably still more for like Gru. um he's kind of like one of the weaker characters in this because he they just keep going through this weird thing where it, they're like trying to show him like being tempted by evil again and, and villainy but again, it's just very weak and when Gru is evil that's when these movies are good mm -hmm. it like that's the whole premise of these fucking movies. That's what sold these movies originally. And that's what, like, Max Landis says. Like, the script is very different. Like, what if somebody who is a supervillain, you know, like, also had heart, kind yeah. of? You know? And that's the heart of these movies. And then again, corporate kind of pushed these minions. And, like, this third movie is really when we get to, like, see the seams of this movie. It's kind of but like, like going even by that aspect, like even if you're not going to have Gru be the villain in this movie, which obviously he shouldn't be, even if he I should be, it, even if it should be, you know, he should be displaying villainous aspects. The mm -hmm. third act of this movie should be he, him seeing himself in Drew, who is being this villain now and him having some sort of conversation or confrontation with Drew. That's like, hey, like. I know what it's like. Like I used to be a villain, but now I've seen kind of the the benefits of having a family and having a right. wife and settling mm -hmm. down and all these like uh, cool things that I'm experiencing now and somehow being able to turn Drew through that. But th we get that turn, but we don't get that confrontation or that conflict. The only thing that happens is that they're mad at each other because Drew was like, oh, I wanted to sell the diamond to get rich and Gru wanted to get his jobs back, which was like the right thing. But then when the, as soon as the kids are in danger, they go to Drew and they're like, oh, the girls are in danger. And he's like, oh, I'm on board. And right. then we never, they kind of apologize to each other on the flight over, but mm -hmm. we never get any actual like, oh, why is Drew changing his mind about being an evil guy? And in the end, it's because, again, I disagree with this choice in the end, but in the end, it's because he ends up becoming evil again. They're setting up for like Despicable Me 4 of like, it's going to be Drew versus Drew in actuality and Drew will be trying to do evil things and Gru will still be the good guy. But I think that's a horrible choice in and of itself because that like really, they sort of came to a nice place where like Drew is with the family at the end. He's like staying in like the minions quarters and he's like got these little kids, these minions that he can like play pranks with and be bad, but he's still got like the benefits of like being in a loving family and being around all them and living with them. And then just literally 30 seconds later, he takes off in a jet plane with the rest of the minions to go do like actually bad villainous stuff. And I was like, you just undid everything that we sort of went through in the character arc for Drew in this movie. And at again, the expense of like, oh, let's, you know, set up the next movie. It might not make sense in the plot of Despicable Me 3 and it might be just be drunk. But I just, I really like the fucking plot of, I mean... 
they've really set it up where it's kind of like uh, it's very sister sister, um, but they're both failures according to their parents, mm-hmm. and um, we don't really get a lot from like Gru's mom who's just being fucked by pull boys. <laughs> Um, that was but, kind of funny, though. That was like a nice no, no, adult it, it thing. Was, it, was, it was really funny. Like, she needs, like, some sort of aqua aerobics from, like, two, like, really, like, handsome <laughs> jacked when the, guys. the second guy, like, comes up uh-huh. that you haven't yeah, seen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she com- <laughs> he comes out of the water, like, to reveal himself. But there's also kind of, like, this... Fuck, man. Like, I thought there was going to be some sort of self-discovery with Gru, where it was, like, Gru... You were right all along, just from instinct. Your father was one of the greatest villains of, like, all time. And they didn't fucking tap into that at all. All they tapped into was, like, Drew feels like he disappointed his father. Yeah. Who's also Gru's father. Like, by like I thought there was going to be some sort of relapse where, like, Gru becomes... It, I, I didn't like... It all, I, I it, didn't it like all the, worked in, like, very weird ways because there was the whole story storyline. I, I didn't story like line. the AVL because... We only saw the AVL at the beginning. They didn't even congratulate Gru at the end. And the Jenny Slate character, she only got to be like a racial st- or like a <laughs> stereotype at like for like she only got to be animated the Jew beginning. face for a couple right. minutes. Yeah, I, I just I wanted this series really works when Gru's a bad person. Well, and there should there should have been an actual arc of him like being truly tempted by kind of like the dark side mm-hmm. because and they sort of set it up where it's like uh he's having like his mojo gone he's lost his confidence after getting kicked out of the avl he has like that mm-hmm. contemplative scene in his like basement where he's just kind of like what am i doing with everything yeah. in less words than that really mm-hmm. um but then they have the scene where they're in the like lair of drew's place and drew reveals that his father was a villain he was one of the greatest villains of all time and he's like you know he, he was so proud of you of like all like the villain yeah. stuff you're doing and that's like mm-hmm. an opportunity where like Gru should have gone like full evil for like a whole exactly. like uh, sort of mm-hmm. section of the story where it's yeah. like yeah that's what i should have been doing the whole time i was right in the beginning and then there should have been something with the family to pull both of them back to the good side of like yeah you know remember why you exactly. were Exactly. in the first place you have all these kids and they want to see a more fuller life mm-hmm. and you have this you know wife that you love that's part of the avl and this fucking disjointed plot like a motherfucker it it, it felt like a plot that or like a script that nobody cared about like someone wrote the first exactly. draft and the executives were like are there minions in it good yep. to go start mm-hmm. animating like we need, it felt like, yeah. it, like mm-hmm. and that's why i also compare it to like a like morning cartoon show where it just seems like executives for those shows are just kind of like you know no one's like it's never going to be considered for an emmy like that's not what we're going for we're just trying to sell advertising yeah. slots to toy companies for kids that are going to watch at nine o'clock in the morning because that's what kids do like, it, 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 it but, doesn't have to be good it just mm-hmm. has to be entertaining and funny and there doesn't have to be that like third act like sentimental arc that is inherent to all movies of any genre it, it, i mean it fucking tricked me it went like fucking like 80s hilarious villain for this new movie now mm-hmm. that grew is good and then it went fucking like funny like hardened minions in jail it, on, on, in this next trailer and it was kind of like fuck i'll sign up like i hate the fucking minions mm-hmm. but like this looks funny like this looks, this looks. They good. were, they, they were, they, they were, were able worse. to market it like really well, and it's just a fucking shit movie. They were worse than I thought they would be in this movie. Like I went in this movie Who? being like the minions. I was like, oh, oh. I, I hate the minions. As the a minions concept. are barely in this movie. It's they don't have it. They don't have time to. But that's like none that's, of the characters have time to. That's fucking like, breathe. the yeah. biggest improvement you can make to this movie is just. And I know they would never do it. So this is just a ridiculous concept to right. even say out loud. You're fucking stupid, Mike. Don't say the minions shouldn't be in this movie. But if you cut the minions out, this is like <laughs> yeah. it's cutting so much dead weight from this movie. Mm-hmm. They're not tied to any of the integral, not even integral. They're not tied to any of the useless plots that are in this movie to begin with. They're not even part of like the bad plots that are in this, much less the yeah. good plots that are in this. They're literally just in there, like, and it's so obvious that they what they're doing with this movie because literally every scene ends with a minions punchline. It's like they're they're on the water on their like speed bikes, and it's like, oh, what's a punchline? pan back and we have the minions on their weird thing and they're trying to spin their bike and it's not working. Every scene is like, here's humans doing this thing, 
pan over here and here's minions trying to do it on their thing, kind of like completely separate. For some reason, there's always two minions in every fucking scene trying to do something. They didn't even really fully, like, whatever. I can accept that two minions came with Gru to this island and they're able to interact with pigs mm -hmm. on this island. Whatever. I'll take that. But don't tell me in the third act, when you have ba Balthazar and all of his fucking, um, like, dolls come to life. Why was there with, not a doll versus lasers? minion fight? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Why did they not serve any there purpose? Was a, the, the minions... Like, is that all the minions amounted to at the end? Is that, like... They popped the bubble gun. They kind of popped one bubble. And it wasn't really even about the bubble, really. It was just about Just cutting. to see them doing something. Yeah, and... It, it, it was just like such like a great intersection of like oh they're heading that way we miss Gru we should help him out. It yes, was they, such a they, turn. Had, they had it written into the. I get so mad thinking about this because it's yeah. so fucking easy to write a good movie if you just pay attention. The girls are in trouble. They're on top of the building. Why are the minions not the ones that save her? If you're gonna have the minions in the movie, like why is it not like oh like those kids are related to Gru. Those are the ones that we should be saving. Gru, go stop the whatever. We'll save your kids. Like, that's a clear opportunity to, like, show, like, bonding between Gru and the minions to have them useful to the plot by saving the kids. Yeah. Like, it's... it's so many <laughs> makes things... Makes me so mad. <laughs> so many things that the minions could have done, but instead they're popping a bubble, which the bubbles are popped basically after the conflict was solved yeah. anyway like you know it, it was just the government stupid. would have handled that <laughs> yeah 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 it was just like it was <sighs> fucking minions 2 2020 we'll be reviewing <laughs> it here on it. how many fingers <sighs> the fucking unicorn storyline as well it was bad it, it was, was like that that was what really I mean, felt like a saturday morning like cartoon Storyline on like Nick Jr. or some shit that like was that. The like fullest storyline between all of the adopted children. I mean, the fucking middle child, middle child has nothing. Was just like I played a prank on somebody one time. Like that was her. She fucking... just had character traits. She didn't have a plot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Miranda Cosgrove's character at least sort of had the. She actually ended up having one of the more fuller yeah. plots just because there was resolution mm -hmm. to it where it was like. She's not relating to her mother. Her mother's trying to be a mother. Mm -hmm. She gives her a little bit of advice. It works out. And then it ends up having the weird conflict. And then she resolves it by just being herself, by mm -hmm. being the action mom. Yeah. That was actually the nicest, cleanest plot in this yeah. movie was mm -hmm. between the two of them. Everything else is just total garbage in this. But the unicorn plot, it was like, they, again, another opportunity where like they're setting themselves up for like, if you're going to have this whole thing about like whoever trying to like str the Lucy struggling to be a mom, mm -hmm. but then Gru keeps saying like, I'm, you know, I know how to like be a dad and he keeps going in and failing and then never succeeds at like successfully telling her that unicorns don't really exist or like letting her down easy. Like it just keeps having these weird, awkward scenes with her right. where he tiptoes around the fact that like unicorns don't exist. And then we never get any like real resolution to that storyline or anything that means anything for the reason that we watched this unicorn storyline playing out. Like, you could have had Lucy be the one who's like, you know, now that right. I've got this newfound confidence yeah. because I beat up this mom that was trying to marry off my kid. Exactly. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to, with, you know, delicacy and grace, tell mm -hmm. her that unicorns don't exist. And she's going to end up being fine with it because she's starting to get older now. Like... Again, let me write Minions 2. <laughs> I'll make it a better movie. <laughs> I was super. I was. I was gonna present the idea to Mike to having my sister be a guest. <laughs> I'm down for that. Bring Christy on. But she loves these movies, and I'm afraid we would attack her too oh. much, and she would get too self conscious. <laughs> we could have her on for something else yeah. that she doesn't care about. But there, we were supposed to have a guest on this, but. Kevin cut his hand too, too bad. Kevin's on bed rest. <laughs> Kevin's on bed rest. He cut his hand while he's cooking. <laughs> he was not able to make it here. Rest Get, in peace. <laughs> rest <laughs> in peace. He'll be on in a future episode. Uh, let's get into ratings. Let's get let's out of this episode uh, to set the stage. Uh, on review aggregator Rotten Tomatoes, 
The film has an approval rating of 61% based on 137 reviews with an average rating of 5.7 out of 10. The site's critical consensus reads, Despicable Me 3 should keep fans of the franchise consistently entertained with another round of colorful animation and zany, albeit somewhat scattershot, humor. Can I say that I really... I do really appreciate... The animation. Yes, the animation and the color palette within this world. It's... There's a reason that this... There's a reason that this... Um, franchise continues to go on and it's in and, and, and I think it this whole production is kind of pro- professionally done um, you know even if the writing isn't top tier mm-hmm. but I think I don't know I, I, I professional th- animation of a shitty script yeah yeah no I, I, I think I think it's like there's... if a college student wrote like a despicable mm-hmm. me three script and then they were like all right yeah let's let People who have been in the industry for like 25 years animate this movie. I think Illumination Entertainment has something here. And I think we can see... I think we're going to see a lot of what they do in the future. Uh, regardless of... Did they do their first Despicable Me? Have they been doing the entire Despicable Me? I one? literally think Illumination Entertainment was just started memes. by... Yeah, um, and probably all the little mini memes yep, films. It was. Oh, you know what? No, it was uh, started by Ice Age. Uh, oh, did yeah. they do the whole Ice Age franchise? Franchise? Um. Okay. No, wait. Hold on. Um, no. Well, they have. Okay, they did Despicable Me, and then they did the Lorax, oh. and then they went right into the rest of. Okay, so. Uh, Ice Age was something that they've previously done. Um, yes, they. I mean, previously, uh, the guy who founded it did Ice Age, Ice Age, the Meltdown Robots, Horton Hears a Who. Mm. And then he went off and uh, founded his own thing where he did Despicable Me, the Lorax, and then went into the rest. Um, so that makes sense. All right, I got to pee really bad. Let's breeze through these ratings if, if you couldn't tell we didn't like this movie <laughs> yeah no yeah. um just to sort of sum it up really quickly like it i know why the movie is the way it is because it sold seats and why pay someone to do a bunch of rewrites if you can just animate the one that they did the first try and just make movie made money like it's why they're going to keep making movies like this how much do you think and it's not like it's not like kids are going makes. on twitter and being like where was the third <laughs> exactly third, you know mm-hmm. part arc of like a drew and Gru's character like yeah. they don't fucking care like the the, no. the minions worked they threw them in there i heard, kids were laughing throughout my theater the entire time it was actually really packed i saw it like two days ago really and okay. it was packed at like a matinee fucking popcorn everywhere why can't kids hold on to popcorn mm-hmm. in theaters it was a ridiculous amount of spilled popcorn <laughs> Like, it was, like, one of the first times where I was, like, oh, my God, like, movie theater employees <laughs> probably hate kids' movies because kids, for some reason, cannot hold on popcorn. Um, snuck into the IMAX. Of this? <laughs> yes, after I saw Baby Driver. Um, I don't know. I thought I was going to get caught for a long time, but I was surrounded by a lot of people. <laughs> it was. It was. It was there was a lot of kids laughing the entire time and um not as much as i've seen in other animated movies though. that's true yeah um i really enjoyed the ending credits though and i wanted the movie oh, to be more I like as soon that as the credits started rolling. oh no you see they had like drew and grew in you know in their white and black outfits and it was very like spy versus spy mm-hmm. And it was like really entertaining, and I really enjoyed it. I was like, "Why wasn't the movie like this?" Because I love like some moments, like they had the one moment where they were like all tangled up, and it was like the yin yang. Uh Um, but anyway, yeah, it it, it'll it'll do its job. It'll entertain the target audience, but as a movie reviewer, that's not the benchmark of good cinema. Is what makes kids laugh or what makes kids entertained. 
invested in this franchise for this long with Despicable Me 1, Despicable Me 2, and Minions. You'll enjoy this movie, is my personal opinion. Yeah, but go on. I have to imagine it's a little bit of a letdown, though. Like, I know, like, kids or whatever, but I know there were, like, Mm -hmm. people my age that saw, like, Despicable Me and were like, it was a really sweet movie. Mm -hmm. I don't think we got, like, any real sentimentality in this movie. And I feel like, I I know it's a little bit of a crutch, but, like, I will always forgive sentimentality in kids' movies and family movies because that's what I want out of a kids' or a family movie is to, like have my heartstrings pulled a little bit in like oh, the definitely. third act. Like yeah. you can always do that in a family movie. You have to you can get away with that every mm-hmm. single time. You have to over exaggerate with the children's movies because they need to catch on to the kind of yeah. beats that you're presenting in the movie. Um, but it, it didn't really get sentimental at all. And it just missed a lot of marks. Um, and we've seen so many examples of like good kids movies that are entertaining to kids that have a little bit of that pandering, but can also be sentimental and put their characters in danger and pull them out of it in a way that is interesting to us, that gets us invested in those characters and the climax makes us care mm-hmm. and has humor that's, you know, funny for adults, but also funny for kids, you know, whether it's two way humor or just stuff that, you know, stuff's going over kids' heads. And then there's humor strictly for the kids. Like, even just this year, like the Lego Batman movie, like, can you think of a more perfect example of a movie in recent memory that like raises the stakes, puts the characters in danger while all. also being lighthearted and funny and irreverent the entire time? Like this tries to be irreverent, like because like the the like climax fight is like, oh, let's like let's uh, dance fight again, right. which is another thing that really pisses me off because it's like there's no growth between the first time they dance fight and the second time they dance fight yeah. it's just it just happens to be a different result this time mm-hmm. like there should have been something that grew learned from drew somehow that helped him defeat you know balthazar brat in that final fight yeah if they're just going to redo the dance fight again mm-hmm. um so i'm going to give it one and a half fingers that's based solely on the strength of the animation which is very very strong it's a very it beautiful is. looking movie mm-hmm. there's nothing that looks like under rendered or mm-hmm. like every like everything looks in focus all the time and it looks like the most detail was paid to like every like pixel right. on this animation. Like there's so much detail, like especially as they're going around the what is the town that they're or the country that they're in? I don't necessarily don't Freelandia know. Freelandia or something like that. It, it is it is a really great I I really enjoyed that island and yeah. all their kind of um customs and like third world country but also European customs. Yeah. yeah. And it was, I really enjoyed that plot line and I wish it went further of the kind of like, they took pity on the boy who wasn't marrying within like the custom and like taking the girl with out of it. Like, yeah. kind of, I, I wish, I wish that went longer. I wish that kind of replaced the unicorn story, yeah. which was just like there's a goat with one horn it was such a departure yes. from everything else that was going mm-hmm. on you're right um and it was i mean maybe because i didn't see the first two movies i was but in this movie i was just kind of like why do we care about that character yeah as it doesn't relate to Gru. like Gru is the main character like give us more of something about his story um but the, the animation is very strong and i think everything really involving balthazar brat is like the high point of this movie like i think his voice acting mm-hmm the character design, the writing around his character, or at least the exposition and the setup of his character, not the way he's handled in the third act. There should have been some kind of redemption story for a character like that, like, you know, mm-hmm. who's kind of stuck as like a perennial kid who just can't, you know, stop being a kid, can't get out of the 80s in the past. Right. Um, but we never got any of that. Um, and there's some funny, there are some occasional funny lines where I did laugh in oh, this movie. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And I'll give credit to those. And then every scene that the minions weren't in was pure bliss. Um, <laughs> but the rest of the movie is 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 pretty bad. Um, I I think I, I left the theater like being like, like I was entertained for most of it. Like right. in my like pure like basal like lizard brain, just mm-hmm. kind of like pretty images, mm-hmm. things happening, like funny sort of jokes. But like when I like left. The, like when I left the theater, I was like, that's like a two and a half finger movie. And then when I reflect on it, and I'm like, those 
storylines went nowhere. There was no growth for any yep. of the characters. There was mm-hmm. no redemption. It was literally just pretty images and like some sort of clever like marketing and creation of the Balthazar Brat character. But everything mm-hmm. else was just kind of like, let's put these old characters that were fresh at one point into a new storyline, but not do anything with them, not do right. anything fresh, not even do anything like, uh, you know, cliche or like trope worthy like in this movie let's just literally put them in situations and just see where it goes and not resolve anything and then we'll just kind of tie everything up randomly for no reason at the end of the movie right so it's a pretty bad movie so i'll give it one and a half fingers mainly animation and balthazar brat yeah carrying that score no yeah i mean i i I wouldn't agree i don't really have that much to say um the balthazar brat character I think definitely, I, I I think there's a reason Trey Parker became attached to this film because they pitched the idea of Balthazar Brad, and that's really funny, actually. It was a really funny character, and again, the opening really kind of, um, there was a lot of, like, great exposition mm-hmm. with him over the course of this movie, but... Uh, as for the the rest of the characters, I mean the the three adopted daughters, um, they barely had storylines. The mother, uh, played by Kristen Wiig, was barely a storyline, and mm. I didn't really fucking care whether they liked her or not. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> and again i didn't really care about that middle child like she honestly doesn't even deserve like a storyline of her own the mm-hmm. older child like i wish there's too many had... kids you can't have that many she... storylines in one movie i mean there's so many storylines there's just too many people in this fucking movie and i mean it's like the minions have their own storyline and the two other minions have their storyline and then the, the lead minion has a storyline. I mean, it's like, where does that leave room for? And I mean, I'm glad we had so much room to uh, develop Balthazar Brat because mm-hmm. like all of his scenes were really funny. But again, I, I think a lot, a lot was left out Um with the minion, I think they could have done some really humorous scenes with the minions, mm-hmm. especially in a series where it's kind of based around the minions. The only reason that they're making a trilogy of these movies is yeah, kids didn't want to see Gru go anywhere again. Minions, yeah. I mean, that's why I think it should have been a more. I said this near the beginning. It should have been more like gold member kind of plot, where like Gru goes to prison with the minions and they have to escape there's no real reason for the minions to escape there's no reason for them to be in prison there's no real reason for them to be in prison either like i think they should have i think Gru should have like relaxed like relapsed and then like all the minions go to prison with him and they act as sort of the mini me from like a gold member i don't know and they escape it, it was just there's so many unnecessary plot points in this movie i can understand why people who enjoy this franchise might enjoy seeing these characters again um even just from seeing the first third or half of the first despicable me <laughs> holding up the dvd that was still on my laptop i was trying to watch it i was trying to watch it while i washed dishes and again i was just like totally turned off of this movie again i think it might have been a product of the year that it came out perhaps it was just something that totally i missed mm-hmm. it was like do you ever feel like that like you missed out on despicable me kind mm-hmm. of like it it could have been like a really cool and original idea if we were doing this podcast and it was kind of like, oh, wow, like this is an animated movie for kids and the main character is a villain, you know? And it has heart and yeah, it's got this nice yeah. reversal of roles. Like I could have even accepted the minions back then, but like now me coming into it, I just don't really fucking now care. Now we've seen what they've become. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> Um, so I think that's all I have to say. The Pharrell Williams score was fucking stupid. Oh my god. There, how many was, Pharrell Williams music breaks do we need where it's it, like, here's this song that you're going to hear on the radio for the next couple of weeks. Here's of, this other song. There's literally like t- 
10 songs for Pharrell they, on the soundtrack. It's just a Pharrell Williams soundtrack. I, I, I kind of want to get into this. I don't want to get into this. But the score sounded exactly like the Hidden Figure score. <laughs> like, literally, like, when she was running to the bathroom, the score that was placed in here of when they were in jail sounded exactly like that. Like, mm-hmm. it, it was just... It, there wasn't much to distinguish one from the other, which ended up kind of sounding racist because the minions were in jail. <laughs> and it was just kind of this assumption of like story about, you know, the African-American struggle compared to like the story of the struggle of the minions in jail. Like it just seems like coming. I, mean, I like, think it was more just like for Williams is like a one trick pony that. Oh no no, no. De- definitely, <laughs> but I I think I think it played against them. Yeah, and it was just kind of, it just it was borderline racist sometimes. Um, I don't know, it was just kind of like there's a lot freedom. of raci- there's a lot of racially racially questionable scenes in this. <clears throat> there the, was the Jew it- the Jew the sort of animated Jew face being one of them. Um, it was, it was, there's a few things like the Eastern European people in that country where it was Mm kind of like, did you have to exaggerate the features Mm -hmm. that much? Do they all have to have like moles all over their face? Like exactly. (laughs) And it it was kind of like the buff white guy in jail. Like what's different between him and the buff white guy in like a drop top listening to Migos kind of. And like, why is you know, why is Gru fucking lashing out against him? It's kind of like fucking like subtly racist in mm-hmm. this movie. It's weird. Um, so I'm going to give this movie a two. Two fingers. It's going to round down to a three. To a one three. and a half. It's going to round <laughs> down now to a average. three. Uh, congratulations. Despicable Me 3 of the year. gets a three fingers <laughs> for Despicable Me 3. 1.75 will round down to a one and a half fingers, one and a half fingers. aka what I gave it. Uh, if you agree or disagree, leave a comment wherever you're listening. SoundCloud, YouTube, you can't listen on Facebook, but if you're watching a little right. clip on Facebook or interacting with us on Facebook, Facebook, Twitter, wherever, just just talk to us. We would love to continue the conversation as, as we've been saying about this movie or of any of the course. movies we reviewed in the past or the future to come. Um, I'm going to drop these links real quick because daddy got a pee. Drop them. How many fingers podcast.com. Everything is on there. Uh, you can find our iTunes link where you can subscribe to us and leave some ratings and reviews. You can mm-hmm. find our mailing list link where you can subscribe to our mailing list on MailChimp. You can subscribe to our YouTube. You can find the link to our merch store, our web store. Get some get koozies, some koozies. t-shirts, stickers, and a package deal with all three for eleven ninety nine. You can find an Amazon link and an iTunes link. Click on either. Anything you purchase within each respective browser window within the next 24 hours, we'll get a nice cut of. Very easy way to support us without going too far out of your way. And I don't know what we're reviewing next week, but tune in and check it out. <laughs> And check out our previous episode of Baby Driver. Last week we got Baby Driver with Jordan, Jordan Weinrich. Weinrich. And the week before that, Spider-Man Homecoming with Spider-Man. We'll see. Spider-Man <laughs> himself. <laughs> I don't want to call out guests before they actually come on here. because Time traveling, we're recording it next week or two days from now. We had a lot of troubles this fucking time <laughs> around. Is this person going to come through? Are they going to come through or are they going to cut their hand cooking and be bedridden for a week? They have to be on bed rest. And Kevin, we love you. You're love always you, welcome Kevin. on this podcast. You're a best friend. But <laughs> you won't actually listen to this episode either. Hope you get better, Kevin. You're supposed to be on this episode, actually, specifically. No, yeah, he is, yeah. Uh, but signing out for How Many Fingers the Podcast, I'm Mike. I'm Joe, and this has been Boys in Baseball Caps. Boys in Baseball Caps. The podcast. Bye.